conflict resolution. We're going to talk about the uh, all kinds because it seems as though we're presented uh, by the various media with, with all kinds of pictures of conflict. Uh, and in fact, it seems as though the, the conflict is, is coming closer. Uh, the, the, the fact that we can not only see what happened, but see it as it's taking place, uh, is, is a little bit frightening. Uh, and this is something that, that I think we all have to deal with. Is there's the conflict that, uh, that is the spectacular kind. And the, uh, what I've noticed is that within the media, even the responsible media, uh, there's that dictum, if it bleeds, it leads, which uh, presents to us sometimes terrifying pictures. And especially when we're presented over and over again from this angle and that angle, uh, we become more conscious of, the, of its presence and it seems more real. The, in addition to that, and I guess I've been referring to the, you know, the kind of violent conflict that that the world is experiencing today. But now in, in our own country, uh, within the political realm, we have all kinds of other conflicts. Uh, and the, uh, the Pew Research uh, has found, this was a study of 10,000 adults, that polarization in American politics has never been so great. We're at the absolute peak of, of, of this kind of, of antagonism, of, of rigid ideologies, which lead to intolerance, to hate, and of course eventually to violence. Anna mentioned the, that, that question, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? And this is a question that was, was asked of a Cherokee Indian chief who had an answer. And his answer was, well, you have to be aware of the fact that within each one of us, there are two wolves fighting. There's the evil wolf, the wolf of anger, hatred, vengeance. And there's the good wolf, the wolf of kindness, generosity, of love, patience, peace. And the questioner asked, well, who, who's, which of the wolves is going to win? And the chief answered, the one you're feeding. <laughs> and you're right, it's a tremendous answer, isn't it? It's a simple answer, but uh, with, with a, just a fantastic, simple depth. The reaction that a lot of us have, I think practically everyone, when be they become conscious of not only conflict as something which is, exists, but seems to be coming closer, is fear. And the fear leads to, how can I protect myself? What can I set up as a barrier, you know, behind which I can feel safe? In the Middle Ages, uh, they built these enormous walls, some of which you can still see in various parts of Europe. Uh, enormous, and, and the thicker the wall, the more protection you have. Today, we do, I think, essentially the same thing. We build walls, they're electronic walls. Walls that protect us, separate us, gated communities, uh, they're used to, to watch us. The, uh, anyone who's taken a flight recently, recently that is in the past 15 years, <laughs> uh, knows the kind of uh, incredible procedures one has to go through to, to protect one again from the, the potential of violence. And in England, and this is perhaps the country which is uh, furthest ahead in terms of, of this kind of electronic protection, in London you can't go outside without being watched. Anywhere, everywhere. You're reading a book at the bus stop, you can be sure someone's reading along with you. You can't drive anywhere in the country uh, without being watched. And this, this sense of, well, this is a way we protect ourselves. Is it? <laughs> Do we actually feel safer because of this? I think that's a, still an open question. Are we safer 
uh, is even a further open question. And the question, is there anything that we can do? Now, obviously there are organizations that are dealing with these kinds of issues. Uh, we have confidence in them, more or less, and they're more or less effective. But the, 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 the question that I'd like to deal with this, this afternoon is that question that was asked of the Cherokee Indian chief, a story incidentally which has been picked up now, I noticed by uh, the internet and some films, they're using my story. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the question itself, uh, is there anything that the man in the street can do, that we, each of us, individually can do with regard to, to resolving conflict in the wide variety of these spheres? not just the physical conflict, the mental conflict that, that we're undergoing this election year, and that I have a feeling is going to continue beyond the election in November. Well, this is a question that was asked of an Interpol officer, Interpol being the International Criminal Police Organization. This is an interview which uh, he was holding in Europe, and he had had experience working with mid-sized cities in Europe that had faced the uh, takeover by the mafia. And the question, is there anything that just the ordinary man in the street can do? The questioner was asking it with the clear ex expectation that of course the answer is no, you know, and therefore we're gonna go on to other questions. But instead, the officer answered yes, there is something that the ordinary man in the street can do. And he explained that in his experience, those communities where there was a sense of honesty, of, of concern for the community, that the mafia could feel that. And they didn't even try to take over those, those city organizations. On the other hand, where there was you know, kind of isolated communities, not a general preoccupation with the, the overall health of the community, they could feel that as well. And that's where they were successful. And this was year after years of his own experience in, in studying these situations. Well, when I heard that, there was something that, uh, that just rang in my thought, and it, it was, the, I think, the basic message of Christ Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. In that, He's talking, Jesus, Christ Jesus is talking about, in, not in an explicit way, but he's talking about this act of thinking and the influence that that thinking has on behavior, on the life and health of our, of our communities. The Sermon on the Mount, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is what some Bible experts describe as Matthew, one of Jesus' biographers, uh, Matthew's attempt to kind of put together in a compressed form the, the basic teachings of Jesus. And there, there are three chapters in, uh, in his account in the New Testament. And Jesus begins by talking about attitudes. Again, a mental approach. How do we respond? How do we, how do we think just in a, in a simple human way? But he, he goes on quite rapidly to consider what in his cultural context was described as the law, the Mosaic law and all the laws which had developed from that in Judaism. And he describes the, the need to move beyond a concept of the law as dictating behavior to an understanding of the law as indicating, kind of outlining how we need to think. And he takes some of the Ten Commandments and illustrates what he means. He takes the Seventh Commandment, for example, thou shalt not commit adultery, and indicates that, of course, the act is important, but it's of, above all our consciousness which is important. He says, if you've lusted after someone in your thought, you've already broken the commandment. The Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not kill, he says, if you're angry with someone, you've already broken the commandment. The need is 
to take action on the basis of that thought, but focus first on the, what's going on in your consciousness. What's happening in thought? And it, it's this basic approach. The, he knew that it was the thinking which determined the behavior, and therefore if you wanted to correct the behavior, you correct the thinking. And you change the thinking. Well, that was a nice, and it is as you read the fifth <laughs> chapter of, of Matthew, it leads very naturally into his consideration of loving. And he, this is, I think, just fascinating because he takes the concept of love uh, and describes the way people feel that, you know, when, when they're loving. And he explains that uh, most of us think we're loving when we respond positively to kindness uh, and that we hold in, in loving regard, of course, our family members, our friends. And what does he say? That doesn't count. That's not real love. He says, even a publican, the worst possible individual in, in the society of his day, these are the individuals who were, well, they were given this wonderful financial advantage by the Roman government if they collected taxes, because they were Jews themselves. And they betrayed their people by essentially forcing them to pay taxes to the Roman government. Even the publicans, love those who love them. That's not a, you're not doing anything special. And then he goes on and indicates what you need to do. And I think it's interesting because he really underlines this. What you need to do is to come to the point where you can love your enemies. That's beginning to love. And to learn to be able to do that is learning to love. And he says this, interestingly, uh, in not an, a, a kind of mild way. It's, I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. He wasn't going easy on us. <laughs> and he was, he really wanted to bring home this point. This is necessary. Now, if you look if you look at that command, love your enemies, is it possible to do that? Can you love someone you've already defined as an enemy? No. Now, we're going to take, uh, I'm going to skip a little bit right now, too, but we're going to come back to that because I think it's important to, to be aware of the fact that to the extent that we have enemies in our thinking, we have a, individuals we can't love. So the question comes, and will come, and we'll see, we'll see that in a moment. What I'd, I'd like to do, actually, is to, to look at different levels of conflict, or, or arenas within which conflict uh, takes place, and as Anna mentioned, I want to do this at the, the most intimate level, the interpersonal family, and then look at the kind of community level, again, at the level where we know individuals interact with them, but it's a, at a larger, more general sphere. And then look at an instance uh, at the national level, kind of national, supranational. I want to point out, however, to, to begin with, that this we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount, this kind of key to, to, to Jesus' teachings, really. And the founder of the church which is sponsoring this lecture, uh, a branch of the Christian Science Church, Mary Baker Eddy respected the Sermon on the Mount in a, to a degree that it's hard to imagine. She uh, indicated at one point that uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea if we had the Sermon on the Mount as our Sunday sermon every Sunday of the year. Uh, she quotes more frequently from the Sermon on the Mount than any other part of the Bible. I mean, that, it was that central to her, that important. And you can feel in her writings something of what Jesus is underlining with regard to the importance of loving. And he saw loving and love itself as a power, as a, as a tremendous force. And that's echoed throughout Mary Baker Eddy's writings. She too saw it as, as the greatest force that exists. 
greater than any weapon of mass destruction. This is something that is solid, powerful with regard to its capacity to change and to bring resolution to conflict. I'd like to begin, I mentioned those three levels, and I'd like to begin at the middle level. This is a personal experience which uh, I went through in a long time ago, actually. It was uh, back in the, the days, uh, I, I'm not going to wax nostalgic, uh, <laughs> but uh, a time when, when there was a tremendous uh, kind of effervescence in the, the uh, popular thinking uh, throughout not just the United States, throughout uh, a large part of the world. Uh, it was the time of the Vietnam conflict, so there was war, anti-war, time of women's liberation, time of civil rights, uh, a time when authority was being seen by a lot of individuals as an, an, a kind of evil. <laughs> We had to invent a whole new structure of government that, uh, that needed to exist. And I was involved in it. I was especially involved in civil rights. Uh, Martin Luther King was my mentor. And the, uh, though I didn't have immediate personal relationships with him, I followed uh, a great deal of what he was training his uh, followers to, to do. I had just... Uh, begun actually, I had moved from Princeton to, to Pittsburgh to take up a new position at the university. And the, this was 1967. In 1967, there were tremendous uh, uh, racial riots in a large number of American cities. In fact, that <coughs> summer I had come back from Europe to the United States on a boat. And uh, I wish I had kept the, uh, you know, they, they, you're four or five or six days on the boat, and they make up little daily reports, and this is long in the past, of course, but they made daily reports of what was going on in the world from the Reuters, AP, and so forth. And to read those reports, you would have thought the United States was all in flame. <laughs> well, that didn't occur at, at Pit, in Pittsburgh. And so we, the political scientists, the sociologists, uh, were the ones responsible for explaining this strange phenomenon. A northern industrial city with a, a large African-American population, peaceful. We found explanations. The city is divided up into different groups. The ghettos are not a single large one. I mean, there were all kinds of, of sociological explanations. And then, April of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the city went up in the worst racial violence it had ever known. Really, it was, uh, the National Guard was called out. There was massive loss of life, property. The National Guard had imposed a curfew in the city for 10 days, 4.30 in the afternoon. I can imagine the severity. And my experience up to that point had been one I had learned with regard to the, the policies of the city fathers, the city councilors, the mayor, uh, that it was a racist city. City councilors didn't want to uh, extend contracts to anyone who was hiring African Americans. Just all kinds of evidence of, of horrible racism. Actually, things which, as the, the riots took place, could be seen as you know, sowing the seeds of the, the basis for that violence. And I must admit, in that getting to know what the policies of the city council were and actively trying to help uh, change them, I hated those people who had made those policies. Not only did I hate them, but I felt very comfortable hating them. And they were evil people. I was perfectly justified. In fact, I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I was a member of the, a branch of the Christian Science Church. And one of the, the directors of the church happened to be African American. He was the first African American on the city council. And he decided that there would be 
an opportunity at this point after the, the riots uh, to invite the city fathers, the politicians, the industrial leaders and some <laughs> leaders from the university to get together to, to think about what, you know, what could we do. This was going to be organized by the church, in the church, uh, and the, the, the directors decided to call it Love Leads the Way. And to my shock, they invited me to be the master of ceremony. <laughs> well, obviously, not only had I not been thinking very much about love, I certainly had to think, been thinking about it leading the way. But I wanted to accept, and I did. And I began wrestling with this, <laughs> this contradiction. And there was a good friend who saw my wrestling and, and said, John, imagine that that individual whom you hate the most on the city council asked you to pray for him. Well, that was it. As a Christian scientist, I had been trained to see prayer not so much as asking God to do something, you know, kind of a favor or special blessing or something, but prayer is, is understood more really as spiritual understanding, understanding the way in which man is related to God, the way in which God is related to all of God's creation, and understanding the, the operation of what we call spiritual laws. And especially if someone asks you to pray for them, one of the prime things that you start out by doing is recognizing that that individual that your physical senses are conscious of is not the true identity of the individual. It's a way of reasoning out from understanding God as as pure love, as, as goodness, uh, as, as a creator which is expressing in its creation all of those qualities of the source, such that man, as godlike, the image and likeness of God, can be understood. But of course, this is an identity which is perceptible only to our spiritual sense, not to the physical senses. So it's kind of pushing mentally aside the the picture, the physical picture. It's also pushing mentally aside the things that we associate with the individual in terms of that individual's history, the background, the acts that they've performed. So in this case, what he was asking me to do, and I, and I recognized it and, and really recognized that was the answer, I needed to push mentally aside the picture of the, the physical individual, and especially mentally aside those acts which I knew the individual had been associated with in the past. And that enabled me to, to sense spiritually God, really, God's expression, the, the fundamental nature of that individual as God created, God maintained. Well, it was a challenge. <laughs> And I was making some progress, not as much as I wanted to. The, the irony in this whole thing uh, is that I had been familiar with the nature of Mary Baker Eddy's description of her church. She describes it as being founded on love. She said the heart and soul of Christian science is love. And she has many statements uh, such as, uh, as truth destroys error, so love destroys hate. Somehow. That had sort of floated over, <laughs> or some, you know, were rather inconsistent, I think, in, in the continuity of our thought. But the interesting thing was that at that point, I discovered something she had written just 80 years before, a little essay called Love Your Enemies. And it was incredibly appropriate. Uh, this is a collection of her, of her writings. Uh, and this little essay appears right at the beginning. She begins uh, with, sentence, with questions. In fact, the three first sentences are, are questions. Who is thine enemy that thou shouldest love him? Is it a creature or a thing outside thine own creation? I had been creating my enemies? 
And she goes on, the third sentence is another question, can you see an enemy except you first formulate this enemy and then look upon the object of your own conception? Yes, I had been creating my enemies. Well, that, that, was, that enabled me to, to do some really clear thinking. And especially to recognize in that process of, of pushing mentally aside the physical facade and then mentally aside, pushing mentally aside the, the historical facade, all those things associated with the individual, I could see that was what I had conceived. That my, was my building of this individual as an enemy. And that was the case, of course, for all the, the individuals whom I had up to that point blamed and, and, and hated because of the uh, evil acts that I'd seen <laughs> as a part of their past. Well, this is, it's a mental process which is, uh, I found, healing. And I must say I hadn't gotten to the point where I had a full, clear understanding of the whole thing, but I had come to a, at least a, a degree of understanding of what was, what, was, what was needed in my own thinking to be able to lead the meeting. And, and the meeting itself didn't bring wonderful solutions directly, but it did sow the seeds for some, some extraordinary uh, changes in the policies of the business school of the University of Pittsburgh, uh, who up to that point had ignored totally all the entrepreneurial efforts of the African American community. And now there were bridges that, that exist still today and are helping the, the businesses of the African uh, American part of our city. And the, th that whole process extended also into the university. And one of the inspirations that, that came through my participation in that meeting was the, the basis for the, the creation of what Anna described uh, as the living unit, which brings together African American students with white students, equal number in a program that's designed, these were full-time students, but students who are interested in going beyond the regular studies to, to explore racism, and especially how it can be dealt with, how solutions can be found in the university context, uh, in the urban context, and more broadly in the country as a whole. Well, the, the idea was approved by the, the university. The university has six vice chancellors. Uh, every one of them assumed that it was a wonderful idea and wouldn't last more than six months. It would be firebombed or more likely the uh, African American students would have such pressure put on them to withdraw that they would collapse. That was 46 years ago. <laughs> it's still intact today. In fact, uh, this is a lecture I gave in uh, Brentwood, uh, Los Angeles, several weeks ago, and I hadn't realized it, but the, there was a resident director there. I should have called on her because she had, uh, this is her first contact with, with Christian Science. Uh, and she was one of the more innovative directors uh, exploring, again, ways in which the understanding, you know, just the overcoming this thing which, uh, which we call racism in consciousness. It's a real challenge. Uh, and she was an innovator in that, in that realm. Well, I've talked a lot about conflict resolution up to this point, but I haven't mentioned an element which is absolutely essential. It's so important that Jesus required it of his students, his disciples, uh, and required it in the way which uh, it was kind of indicating there's, you can't get around it. But it's very difficult. So uh, Peter, who seems to be the one who was, you know, the, the one in class who asks questions uh, <laughs> immediately. Uh, Peter, knowing it was so difficult, asked Jesus, well, if I try this at least seven times, is that enough? You know, you, you remember what quality that is? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Yes. And you remember Jesus' response? Yes. Seven Not until 17, seven times, but until 70 times seven. And as I've 
indicated before. That doesn't mean that when you've reached the 191st time, <laughs> you're off the hook. It means no exceptions. You must reach forgiveness. And what's interesting is that forgiveness is a part of learning to love. It's what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks explicitly quite a bit about forgiveness in the Sermon on the Mount. So how do we, how do we get to this point? Well, it's really the means that I've described as the, when I was attempting to imagine how I could pray for that city councilor. Uh, it's pushing aside the picture of the, of the individual as a physical being and the picture of the individual as this historical entity. And just parenthetically, the, that person whom I identified as the one that I hated the most on the city council was the agent for the establishment of the intercultural house at the university. He offered to help us find a, uh, a building that would be inexpensive to renovate and to change into a, a kind of new dormitory. Uh, and for the next 15 years, he became really my closest helper in, in terms of city relationships and getting all the permissions that we needed to, to, uh, to have that house. But forgiveness is, it's a, it has a, a peculiar nature. We, we tend, I think, when we, we know that forgiveness is important. But how do you forgive someone who has, you know, whom you've identified as I had for the, in this case, with someone who is, who is really pretty horrible. Well, I think the first tendency is to try to find something good about the individual. And the problem with that is that it leads us right back into seeing the historical nature of that individual, accepting him as a human being. So what I'm, what I'm indicating here is really it's, the, the requirement here is to go beyond the human, is mentally to push aside that picture of the individual, not only as the physical entity, but also as the historical entity. And when those two facades are removed, then we're able to sense spiritually, to see with our spiritual eyes, God's creation. And of course, when we see God's creation, we can't help but value it. It's something wonderful. It's, it's something beautiful. And so we love it. And so you can see how forgiveness is, is related to love. There's, in the realm of conflict resolution, and it's a, it's a, a burgeoning field <laughs> with all the conflict you can imagine, there's all kinds of institutions that are anxious to, to support uh, this effort to find resolution for these conflicts. And there's a lot of good work being done. And interestingly, and I think very appropriately, a lot of emphasis placed on forgiveness. The problem is that the forgiveness doesn't go far enough. There's a, a, a few descriptions that have to do with, the, uh, with this, what I call a human forgiveness. And mind you, human forgiveness is compared with vengeance, anger, is wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it's, I don't want to put it down. It is accomplishing wonderful things in the world. We can go further, and that's the, the point I'd like to make. The human forgiveness is defined as refusing to feel anger, to grant pardon for the remission of an offense. It's a conscious decis decision to release feelings of resentment, vengeance toward a person or group, regardless of deserving forgiveness. All of this is is, is great, but it needs to go further. And essentially what I'm saying is that for divine forgiveness, we need to make that extra effort really to, to love, to come to the point where we're able not to look at the human situation and, and see past it and not react and so forth, uh, but instead to see, having pushed aside those two facades, the physical facade and the historical facade, to begin to sense the godlike nature 
of the individual or of the group. That's the divine forgiveness that, that we need to find. And the, 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 the discovery of that forgiveness, in a sense, in our own thought, is incredibly freeing. Uh, as, we, as we reach that point where we're able to, to love genuinely God's creation, we, we, we're not reacting anymore. Let's see, the, uh, one of the highways that you travel frequently is um, 101. So you're, you're cruising down 101, being very careful to patiently uh, stay within the, the limits of uh, all those requirements. And suddenly someone zips past you, uh, going twice as fast as you do, and then suddenly pulls in front of you, slams on the brakes. I don't know about your reaction, but mine typically is, Stupid idiot. <laughs> you see, I haven't reached that point that Jesus is recommending. <laughs> but now the question comes, mentally, what do we do with the stupid idiot? Do we forgive the stupid idiot? No. That's exactly, that's human forgiveness and it's better than than reacting madly and <laughs> doing something irrational. But, uh, but no, that's not the answer. The answer is to recognize that you need to see through that thing that appeared to be the stupid idiot to the godlike nature of that individual. So it's not only not reacting, that's good, but it's being able to see, to sense spiritually. And this gets right at the heart of what Mary Baker Eddy has discovered, this is, this is an individual, Mary Baker Eddy, recently described as the most profound theologian of modern times. She understood as a different dimension of Jesus' teaching how Jesus healed. And the, the description that she gives, it's an interesting one. This is uh, the book that Anna was describing that's available uh, at the back for the rock bottom price of five dollars. <laughs> uh, it's Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Uh, it's, Mary Baker Eddy wrote a number of books, but this is the book that, that she worked on year after year after year. It was published in 1875, but she spent the next 35 years revising it. She wanted to make it simple, practical, usable by anyone, understandable by everyone. Uh, and in it, she describes how Jesus healed. Now, this is not a, an elaborate description. It's a very brief passage. But for me, it, it captures essentially what I've been talking about uh, as the basis of, of love. She says, Jesus beheld in science. Beheld, he saw, spiritually, obviously not physically, in science, from a spiritual perspective, he beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. So he was seeing through these, these two facades. He was sensing spiritually the true nature of man. So that's the first sentence. He beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. And here she gets to the, the, the key, really, to the this healing process. In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness. And this correct view of man healed the sick. It was sensing spiritually the real identity with the recognition that this is the real identity, the, the godlike nature. Everyone has a godlike nature. That is their true being. And it, it's coming to the point where we can see, sense spiritually, that identity. This is something that, that she experienced herself, uh, just very briefly to give you a little bit of background. She grew up in a very religious family, uh, had physical problems of a wide variety of uh, wide nature, and, and sought healing uh, in the Bible. She had learned that that, that was the, the basis, really, of healing. But the healing was never permanent. 
she sought healing through medical means, and she studied practically all of, all of this, not practically, in fact, all that the medical uh, field had to tell her about it at that point. This was uh, the mid-1800s. Uh, again, some occasional relief, never complete healing. And then there came what she describes as the falling apple, <laughs> referring to Newton's discovery of gravity. And the falling apple for her was an experience that she had. She had a very severe accident, one her doctor felt was fatal. Uh, and as usual, she turned to the Bible for an answer, reading how Jesus healed, reading descriptions of, of Jesus' healings. And that, essentially that understanding, something that, that is equivalent to the recognition what he was doing was training his disciples to use their spiritual sense to break through the facades, to see the real identity of the individual being healed. And it was kind of breaking out of the, this false education that our physical senses have trained us to accept as true into a, a new, clearer perception of the, the real nature of, of man and in particular of the, the individual who is to be healed. Well, I'm putting the, that, my words essentially at this point, that she, I don't think it was as clear to her at that point. She knew she'd been healed. She felt that it was something that could be understood, that it was certainly similar to the healings that she'd read about so often in the Bible. And the key here is that she felt she could understand how it was done. And so she searched the Bible for the next several years. It, within that first year, she tested it and found that she was able not only to heal herself, but to heal others. And cases of, of deafness, of tuberculosis, uh, a, a, a variety just within that first year. And then she went further and a try, she recognized that if this was something that could be understood, and it wasn't you know, something special about her or about Jesus, but something that could be learned, that that meant that she could teach it to others, that they in turn could heal. She tested that and found, yes, that was also the case. So at this point, she was really confident that she was clear about this breakthrough in a sense of understanding how Jesus healed. She trained what are called practitioners, individuals who, who actually full-time uh, heal, offer their services to, to uh, others to, to heal problems. And this was uh, something which began, became more and more demanded. Uh, there were individuals who, uh, in greater and greater numbers in cities around this country and eventually in other parts of the world, who were asking for healing. And she needed to have other people train uh, practitioners. Well, we'll come back to this in a, in a little bit later, but the reason I'm saying this is the, to kind of indicate the, the gradual development of the movement. By the beginning of the 20th century, there was a, a church, there was a worldwide movement actually in, in terms of individuals who were being healed, who wanted to learn how to heal, uh, and at this point, she was one of the most famous individuals in the world. There were, this was a, a period of yellow journalism. Uh, journalism not so much concerned with the truth of the articles as with making money selling the newspapers. And the, uh, the two major newspaper chains, the Hearst chain on the one hand and the Pulitzer chain on the other, were competing with each other. And uh, one of them got the bright idea why don't we, here's this elderly lady, very famous, living up in Boston, the Boston area, uh, actually in Concord at that point. Uh, let's write stories about how she's not what she appears to be. She's really mentally deficient. Uh, that she is, then there were stories about her death, that sold a lot of copies, uh, encouraged that in the, they, she proved that she was very much alive. Uh, then, well, okay, she's at least uh, has dementia and is, is not capable of, uh, of, of governing this large 
religious movement that she'd began. Well, this was a, and they, it was very serious. Uh, it was an enormous attack, which uh, gained ground as, as they saw this is selling more and more copies, and over a period of six months, they made millions of dollars uh, selling more newspapers. So they decided, we'll carry it a little bit further. We'll, we'll uh, sue her, and we'll get individuals who are being uh, damaged because of her mental deficiency, and they persuaded her son, her only son, to join them. And he was willing to do so. Uh, why is a whole set of other reasons. But uh, I'm describing that because her response to that learning of that betrayal, essentially, in an absolutely crucial moment when, if this suit had, had been successful, her religious movement, all that she had worked the preceding half century to to develop would have gone crashing. This is one of the lines from a letter that she wrote to her son George. Why do you allow yourself to be used to bring this great grief and trouble to your aged mother? Not a horrible condemnation. <laughs> and frankly, it characterizes her response, her thought. She was a wonderful healer of all kinds of diseases, but also of a, a wonderful expressor of that idea of forgiveness that I've been talking about. And she never once reacted in a negative way, thought of condemning uh, George, or in fact any of the other individuals. On the contrary, she prayed for them which is exactly what Jesus requires us to do. You remember in that passage, is pray for those who despitefully use you and curse you and so forth. And so this was just that, that beautiful expression, a natural one. Uh, she couldn't, <laughs> because of the, the nature of her, the constancy of her love, she couldn't come to a point of condemnation, but, but there was just that, that natural forgiveness. And the suit, incidentally, was uh, thrown out uh, as soon as they had a, a group of individuals who the court appointed to interview her, and, and she was alert, sharp, uh, gentle, loving, obviously in command, and, and so the suit fell apart. Well, forgiveness is not something that was uh, frequently associated with South Africa in the second half of the 20th century. Now, I want to describe just briefly the, uh, the, the situation, most of you, many of you at least, uh, I'm sure are familiar with it, either having lived through it or learned about it subsequently. But during the second half of the 20th century, the world was moving rapidly, not very consistently, but nonetheless rapidly in the direction of recognizing civil rights, human rights, the French and English empires, British empires, were broken up, the new colonies were becoming independent countries. It was a, it was a movement in which there was greater freedom and, and the recognition of civil rights, except for South Africa, which was moving even more rapidly in the opposite direction, in which the idea of apartheid, of separateness, of, of really creating concentration camps in the country. This was a country over 80% black, under 20% white, and the 20% was the government, and taking away all, all the rights and, and privileges of the, of the black population, and oppressing. And when the, there was reactions, massacre. I mean, it was, it was horrible, and it was getting worse. In the mid-'80s, I remember this very clearly, because I was <laughs> very concerned about there were efforts to to exert influence on the South African government, all of which seemed not only to fail, but to actually produce an opposite reaction. No one, no, I met no one who could think of anything that would happen other than the worst revolution in the history of the world. A bloodbath of un extraordinary proportions. You can imagine 80% being oppressed and finally revolting. And it was in this context that I was put into contact with a number of individuals from South Africa, all of whom had spent time in South African jails, 
who saw beyond the revolution. Of course, there would be the revolution. But they saw the need for a framework that would essentially pick up the pieces after the revolution, a constitution that would be available to recognize the proper balance of rights in the country. And as, as we worked together, we saw that there was also a need for some kind of institution which would provide a framework for mending the, the tears in the social fabric. Well, this is, uh, frankly, it was the most exciting period of my life. These individuals were full of forgiveness. Their, their thought was of such a nature, was characterized incidentally by, by some activists which were still in South Africa, the, one of the important ones of which was Desmond Tutu. He received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984. And in his acceptance speech, he, he indicated that a life without forgiveness is not a life worth living. And I, that characterized the, the attitude of these individuals, uh, the primary of which is Dennis Brutus, a, a wonderful individual who, who was kind of their leader. And, and he and I worked together. Uh, I had taught constitutional law, obviously was involved with human rights. And I think that was the reason I was asked to be a part of this group. And we, we talked about religion, about forgiveness, about the need for learning to love. Uh, he, he himself had uh, worked out a number of ideas in this realm, but, but we spent long evenings uh, coming to the point where, where we were able to see through the physical, historical facades of those leaders of the apartheid movement and be able to love their real nature, their godlike nature. Well, we were working at this when what I consider the, the greatest miracle of the 20th century took place. There was a new election in, uh, in South Africa. The old president, who was already reactionary, was replaced by one assumed to be even more reactionary. No hope, F.W. de Klerk. And yet his first public act was to forgive, to pardon Nelson Mandela. And that began a kind of snowball of forgiveness. The ANC, the African National Congress, uh, the opposition to the apartheid government forgave. The apartheid government forgave, forgave others. And in the next uh, three years, it was, it was just a, a, a wonderful flowering of, of forgiveness, uh, culminating in the election of Mandela, uh, the most democratic elections up to that point in the history of Africa. And there was this framework uh, available for a new constitution. And, and this is, uh, in a sense, I think, the, uh, the, the, the crowning uh, aspect of this demonstration. And that is the establishment of a court, a regular court with judges, in which if someone were to request forgiveness, pardon, amnesty, uh, someone who had committed acts totally outside the legal framework, some of them horrible acts, in the face of their victims. And it was judged that that was a sincere request and the victims were in agreement. Uh, the amnesty would be granted. This commission was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And you can see it, PBS has some uh, footage of, of some of these trials. And they're heartrending. The individual genuinely asking for forgiveness and some horrendous acts. Uh, and the, the tears of the, of the family who are, who, who are willing to at least ex extend that forgiveness. And well, to me, it's just a, a beautiful example of what can take place with a, in the realm of, of formal institutions. Here's a court based on Forgiveness, based on this essential element of love. Not the sort of thing we usually associate with uh, courtroom activities. Well, I, I mentioned the, uh, the activity of 
Mary Baker Eddy in her, her efforts to extend the teaching of Christian science uh, to the world. In the 80s and 90s, she realized that it was going to be helpful to, to send teachers who were able to train practitioners, these individuals who were engaged in individual healing, uh, to send them to large cities in the United States, in fact, in other parts of the world. And she did that. And there was conflict. In uh, New York City, in particular, uh, there was an individual, a teacher, who kind of assumed that because of her charisma and perhaps other special qualities, she should be the leader. Uh, it was kind of a you know, question of this traditional uh, issue of who shall be the greatest. Well, she knew she was to be the greatest, and she started exercising this dominion in an oppressive way over the other teachers in New York City. These were all students of Mary Baker Eddy. And, of course, when Mary Baker Eddy became aware of it, she, uh, she took action right away in her prayer, of course. Uh, but I'd like to read you a part of a letter that she wrote to Laura Lathrop. This is uh, another teacher in, in New York City. And to me, it's a wonderful illustration, not only of the, the act, the mental effort that it takes to, to love and to push aside the, the different facades, but also to, uh, to, to accompany that with the practical aspects of how do we love? Well, how, we, how can we show it? It's not just something, you know, if it's in thought, it's there and it's important, it's crucial, that's the foundation. But then it has a natural human expression. She says, you have entered the straight and narrow path that leads to bliss, eternal, ever unfolding love. Oh, press on, darling. Never look back. Love all, underline. Love all, overcome evil with good. Bless them that do not feel like blessing you. Oh, love all, everyone, and especially love your enemy if you have one on earth. And she goes on, do good to them that know not how to do themselves good. Help them to know. And then later she says, go to Mrs. Stetson, that's that charismatic leader I was telling you about. Go to Mrs. Stetson. Put your arms around her neck. Tell her how you feel. Oh, love one another, even as Jesus the Christ hath loved you. And she finishes the letter, I thank my father for your new birth. Well, that's what it was for Laura Lathrop. It was a new birth. It was the, it was the resolution of conflict as far as she was concerned in terms of her relationship with Augusta Stetson. That was 1890. I'd like to fast forward now 100 years to 1990 and describe a little bit the, the situation of a, a woman who had been married for 20 years, had children, uh, felt that her marriage was really a wonderful part of her life. Uh, we'll call her Susan. And she discovered that not only was her husband being unfaithful, but that he had been during her whole marriage. And this was a shock, to put it mildly. She, was, she had a heart attack. She was paralyzed uh, in her side and her left arm. She was a Christian scientist. And she had had healings. She had understood what Mary Baker had to teach is about how Jesus healed and put it into practice for herself, for her children, uh, had been very effective. So she naturally turned to a practitioner to help in this uh, extraordinary circumstance. Uh, and she explained what the uh, situation was. The practitioner answered, well, of course, my dear, you must begin by forgiving your husband and his mistress. What? <laughs> Who's the victim here? Well, she felt that was not only asking the impossible, it was going way beyond. Uh, and so she, knowing that, sort of, that she had been effective in her prayer, 
uh, in the past she hung up, I'll take the case, and, uh, and began prayer for herself. And she prayed uh, along the lines that I've described with regard to herself, seeing through the physical, sensing spiritually her, her godlike nature. During that time, the, uh, the mistress uh, sent the, the love letters for her husband to her, s contacted her eldest child, uh, harassing in general, so much so that she, she felt like calling the police at one point, but she didn't. Uh, but she did continue the, the prayer, and days ran into weeks, weeks into months, and there wasn't any progress. She learned to kind of disguise the, uh, the paralysis in her arm, uh, but there wasn't any improvement. And in fact, the arm, for lack of use, uh, became just half its normal dimension. And at the, at the point at which the, the paralysis seemed to be creeping up her, her shoulder and into her cheek, she realized she obviously was on the wrong track, or at least she had to correct something. And the idea that came to her was, I'm realizing these laws as they apply specifically, but I'm not seeing the law. She realized if she was to see herself from a spiritual perspective, herself as godlike, how could she not accept the idea that that was the nature of her husband and even of his mistress? And she saw the inconsistency, and she began to correct it. She began that effort at, at genuine forgiveness, at divine forgiveness. Not, and this is an important point, not accepting the disrespect, uh, the, the infidelity, and all the things that are associated with it, as that, though that were good or normal, or actually could be forgiven. It was the, the, the divine nature of that individual that she was to see, and that was the, the forgiveness. Now I'm saying that because sometimes people associate forgiveness with overlooking instances or somehow uh, accepting them as that, so that's normal. She recognized that was not the case. Her sole desire was to see through that fake picture of her husband and his mistress, to, to sense spiritually the divine nature. And as she did so, the paralysis disappeared. The, after a period of time, the, the arm was able to move regained its strength. That was 26 years ago. Uh, she's quite an athlete today. But of course, it's, it's what took place in her thought. It's that, that focus that we've had from the very, the very beginning of what's going on in our thinking. How can we use that really as the, as the basis of her feeding the good wolf? The Indian pacifist uh, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And in, in, as we, I think it's a wonderful recommendation because as we acknowledge the goodness, of course of ourselves, but also of every other creation of God, we are breaking through the, the, the picture which is preventing the world, really, from arriving at its concept of forgiveness, but it enables us to reach that point of clear seeing and of freedom. And that's the, that's the, the way in which we arrive at loving, which is the real solution, resolution of conflict. Well, I want to thank you. You've been a wonderful audience this afternoon. Thanks so much.